Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Michael took a pack of Marlboro Gold out of his pocket, unwrapped the cellophane wrapping, took out a cigarette and held up the lighter. Taking two deep puffs, he looked around and thought a little. For the last 10 years of his life, he had been pedantically living on a schedule. He liked everything to be on time and hated people who were late. Michael calculated even little things like time to get on the platform and have time to smoke a cigarette before the train arrived. There were few people around. He was in a distant and small town, popularly called the Hinterland. Michael was even surprised that there was a train station here. Suddenly he felt some movement on his right. Turning his head, the man saw a short girl. She was wearing a simple dress, white and sneakers. She was carrying a heavy bag, but her pretty head with nice facial features was a red barret, which now and then struggled with a large braid of her dark hair. The girl with elegant sloppiness and was correcting the barret while trying to keep her bags in her hands. Michael looked at her sympathetically, tossed out a flick of the cigarette he had started and went to help. Shaking his head slightly, he pronounced, it's a bit heavy. Such a small girl to carry such heavy bags. Then he calmly took her luggage and they headed towards the train. Oh, thank you very much. She thanked him. What would I do without you? I'm here for my fiance's food. The girl looked at the man so sincerely that his heart gave a little twinge inside. She had big blue eyes and a dazzling smile. A smile that could make anyone speechless with admiration. Michael had not felt such feelings for a long time and did not understand what was happening to him. Then the girl asked, which carriage are you in? In the ninth, smiled the man. Yes, and me too. Could you? Could I? Michael didn't let her finish, and at that moment he smiled even wider. Some part of him felt like a complete idiot. Meanwhile, the train was approaching the platform. Two grandmothers sitting on a bench stood up and walked duck-like toward the cars. The train had only been stopped for three minutes, so the passengers on the platform scurried about. Michael and the girl quickened their step and quickly reached the ninth carriage. The conductor routinely checked their passports. Michael picked up their bags, and they were already walking down the corridor. What compartment do you have? He asked. Eighth, the girl smiled. And you? There you go. What a coincidence, he thought. Maybe we will go to the same station with her. Then he said, it turns out we're neighbors. I'm in eighth grade too. Wow, how it happens. The girl laughed. So you didn't meet me by chance. I guess so. They went into the compartment. He put away in bags on the bottom shelf. She took out a bag from one of them and told Michael to get out so that she could change. The man stepped out into the corridor, leaned back and on his errand, and stared out the window at the summer afternoon heat. The train touched down and glimmered with. Michael saw endless green fields and quite a large state of thought flowed easily in his head under the clatter of the train wheels. It's been a long time since he had been to his homeland, he thought. Homeland and Michael called not the city where his parents lived, but his grandmother's village. He used to spend vacations there when he was a boy. He and the other boys used to go fishing, ride bicycles, swim in the river, grill kebabs, and build a shisha. And when the weather was rainy, they would gather at his or Max's house, playing board games all day, or was that it? It was a glorious time, easy and carefree. He still kept in touch with some of the boys. Whenever possible, Michael tried to visit his parents and then stopped by his grandmother's house when it was the weekend or when he went on vacation. But three years ago, his grandmother passed away. Michael loved her very much and took the loss very hard. He could not come to the funeral because he was on a business trip abroad for a long time. He tried to ask for an excuse, but his superiors wouldn't let him. As his supervisor William, with whom they'd always had a great relationship, put it, Mike, honey, but I can't let you go. You know, not even for three days. You're too important around here. You go away and it's all over at once. Do you know how important our work is? Everyone understands. It's a tragedy. Your family's grieving, but my hands are tied. Understand that. Do your job and I'll clap so you can get a bonus. And only three years later, after a long business trip, he still managed to come to his homeland. 
He paid off his parents. They talked about this and that. Again they asked when he would get married. But Michael had no one in mind. Then, when he was about to leave, his mother recommended that he take the train to his grandmother's village. She also told him where her grave was. Michael sank a little into his childhood memories. Suddenly, he heard he could leave. I'm all done now. The girl wore a gray tracksuit and slippers. But even in spite of this appearance, she was charming. To himself, the man called her Cinderella. I'll run and get you some tea. Michael did not like intimate conversations on the train with strangers. And he didn't really want tea. But to refuse such a nice girl was uncomfortable. So he said yes, go ahead. Try entered the compartment, carefully, holding in her hands two steaming mugs of tea. She set them on the table, and Michael thanked her. He began to consider her even in that sports sweatshirt, and you can make out her beautiful figure. Without the birch, it was as if her braid had become twice as big. The girl looked thoughtfully out of the window. Simple country beauty, Michael thought. My name is Becky, the girl said unexpectedly and extended a gentle palm to Michael. He shook her fingers, looked into her eyes and answered Becky. Becky then, and I'm Mike. Michael then, the girl joked. He smiled at her. Then she asked him to stand up, pulled out her bag and started getting food out of it. Apple pie, candy, cucumbers, tomatoes, eggs, green onions and bread. Will it be a week's ride on the train? Michael thought to himself. Mike, and you do not look just so said the girl treats the whole pie tea. Try it. I made it myself. It's delicious. No, Becky, thanks. I ate at my mom's before I went out until I was hungry. Oh, well, okay, shrug. But if you want some, feel free to have some. There was a kind of emptiness in the man's mind, mixed with a strange excitement. He realized he liked her. The girl was attractive, but she has a fiancé, Michael told himself. You have to behave yourself. Damn, but she's really pretty. I'm going to the end of the line. Becky interrupted his thoughts. You're the one who'll have to put up with me for 24 hours, Michael joked. At that, he felt his heart beat joyfully. Becky laughed, covered her mouth with her hand, and said, no, I think you're very nice and kind. Thank you. And I'm going to the military unit. I have Alex mine. You know where it is? Oh, come on. Michael marveled at those words. Of course he knew. First of all, the military unit was only one in 20 kilometers from my grandmother's village. In the second place, he was also going to that unit because he was a military man. Ironically, his command had sent him there to serve. Further orders, seriously not hiding his surprise, exclaimed Michael, almost choked on his tea. Oh, I'm sorry, I said something wrong. No, it's just, it's just that I have to go to the military unit too. Really, such a coincidence. The girl was amazed. What about you? Are you in the military too? Well, you're military. Military, he nodded and drank his tea. He was getting uncomfortable. So you probably know my Alex. Michael looked at her in surprise. Alex Loud is a chief warrant officer. He has a funny last name. My mom always swears how I will marry before him with such a surname. The girl laughed and I've already decided everything for myself. You know that I will be with my last name entirely. I like it better than Loud. What's your last name? Morris. Loud, Michael said. And so he started to change it in conversation. Oh, do you have a non-military last name? No, I'm sorry, but no offense. If I knew you, I'd think you sold toys to kids. You're just so kind and your last name is so cute. Why are you frowning? I said something wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, my mom always tells me I'm always saying the wrong thing. No, it's okay. Michael tried to speak neutrally, not to give vent to his emotions, as he was always taught in the service. I know you're Alex, he said and drank his tea again. There were different bad rumors about Alex Michael. Michael knew that he was not a fool to drink and often found himself on duty drunk. He was also accused several times of stealing military property, but nothing could be proved. To think, Michael thought to himself, such a beautiful girl, and got involved with a swindler and an alcoholic. How is it possible? Why do girls always fall in love with some assholes? But maybe he'll change with her. Maybe he changed for her. 
No, I saw his personnel file the other day. He's not fired just because there's no staff. Uh, that's what I have to say now. What do you know about my LX? By the way, he's going to study to be a lieutenant. He's tired of being a chief warrant officer. What's your rank? Captain. Michael said dryly. Wow. And that's how many stars on your epaulets? Five. Asked Becky. And the man laughed heartily not smart girls in military matters, and said five stars Becky only in Turkish hotels. And the captain has four stars. And she stretched out understandably. And can I speak to you? Unexpectedly suggested Michael. And let's. Becky agreed and again extended him a lovely hand. Wonderful. Where is it? You met Alex. I've been friends with him since high school. He was in the same class as me. In 10th grade, we started talking a lot, and in 11th grade on September 1st. Can you imagine, he took me to the park for a walk by the hand, took me and said, I can't live without you. The girl is very talented, portrayed the intonation of a lover. What made the two traveling companions laugh? That's what he said. Michael asked, that's what he said. So we started dating there. We graduated high school together. I went to our local institute. My dream is to study hard and go to school to work. I want to teach children Russian language and literature. How nice, Michael thought. And my Alex after school served a year in the same unit. By the way, I went to him all the time, as now I was waiting for him. He came back and said he would marry me. But first he'll go to Warren officer school. He liked the military very much. That's the whole story, I wanted to become an ensign quickly and return to the units. He also said that military men get apartments. When he graduates, he'll marry me. And we'll already have an apartment. It's great, isn't it? Do they already give apartments to military men? Michael replied. The state provides a serviceman with an apartment at the place of his service. A social lease agreement is drawn up there. Alex told me the same thing, I think. So we are all waiting. But the apartment is still missing. Alex says he's on some waiting list and they won't give us an apartment yet. And I really need it, you know, Becky said a little irritated. No, by the way, it's already 22, and I'm still living with my parents. All my girlfriends laugh at me. They've all gotten married. Some didn't have kids anymore, some left our town. Husbands, you know, families. And I'm even called an old maid. Can you imagine? It's a shame. So I keep asking Alex, when will we get an apartment, when? There's a clue. I say I'll go to work together and we'll take out a mortgage. No big deal, we'll pay it off. And he said he's out of his mind. You're going to work for these banks all your life. Where's the apartment? I'm waiting you wait and don't show off. Can you imagine? They can't do anything normal in the country. They promise, they promise everything. Oh, Becky sighed sadly at the end of her monologue. For a while, the fellow travelers rode in silence behind the window in a single green canvas left landscape. The train was traveling very fast, swaying slightly. The sun had already left the zenith and was lazily descending to the horizon. It was a little stuffy in the compartment, so Becky picked up a book and waved it away. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You're asking yourself, the girl said. It's the atmosphere, Michael remarked. It's a train compartment. You want to talk about life. Sometimes I've heard that people open up to fellow travelers more than to friends or family. Something about them on the road. Becky was silent for a moment, looking out the window of the train. Then she said, Everybody in town drinks, you know, it's so scary. My mother was a drinker all her life. My father died two years ago, kidney failure, so I was raised by my grandmother. She's my whole life. Never had a drop of alcohol in her entire life. Neither have I, how did I see all this? Oh, I'm not like that, guys, it's not for me. I'd rather study. And Alex is my drinking buddy too. We've had a few fights about it. He keeps telling me to quit, I'll quit. When I marry you, I'll quit. I get a lieutenant, I'll quit, I'll quit. Yeah, Becky just started twiddling her thumbs. No apartment, no lieutenant, no marriage. Can you imagine? Oh, at least I'm drinking less. It's not what it used to be, but who knows? The man looked out the window, they were driving over a bridge over a river. There was a small village on the bank, 
Then the endless forest began again. Are you married? Becky asked. Michael answered sadly. Oh, I'm sorry, please, worried the girl. I didn't mean to. It's okay. Are you divorced? Yes. Why did the feelings disappear? I don't know, shrugged Michael. Were there feelings there at all? I think she had more feelings for my wallet. I'm a military man, and my salary is good. I was on business trips, and they gave me an apartment by the way. So she had her eye on me. I took care of her. Beautiful, I gave her expensive gifts. My father, I remember, was always against this marriage. He used to tell me, oh, I don't like Mike, it's your Kate. Oh, I don't like her. And I was so much in love with her, I didn't see or hear a thing. And that girl was just a plain old hustler. She came from some distant town to conquer Moscow. She saw me and realized there was something to be gained here. I proposed to her, and she had her head wrapped around my neck. Three years of marriage, but I was always traveling on business. She needed a bigger apartment or a car. I took her to the sea twice a year. And children? Did she want children? Becky asked. Michael waved his hand. She was interested in nothing but money. Too bad I realized it only after the divorce. So then, I come from a business trip, I open the door to the apartment, and there she is with her lover. Becky guessed. Madame, you think like a detective. I am still a mademoiselle. Coquettishly replied Becky, shooting her eyes at Michael. Then she felt a pleasant warmth spread through his body. I haven't been married yet. Well, Michael continued. Here we have a divorce of the maiden name. And you loved her. Becky asked sympathetically. Very quietly said Michael. You're bound to find someone better. She'll love you. She'll give birth to a bunch of kids, a whole company of soldiers. The girl laughed. Well, yes, the division supported her joke, Mike. No, really. Here you are a young and handsome captain with an apartment, with money. An enviable groom, I must say. The girl comically carried her arms at her sides, playfully moving her shoulders. Does she really like me? Is she flirting with me? Michael thought, looking at her. The two of them laughed. Then Becky asked. After her, didn't you have anyone else? Did you look for one? When to look for sink, I'm always on business trips. I see, she sighed. They spent the rest of the day in silence. Becky read a book. Michael napped for a bit. There were a couple of stops in equally distant villages, but no one sat in the compartment. He would go out to smoke on the platform and watch people get out of the carriage. At one station he bought potato pies from his grandmother and appetizingly sliced them with tea. It didn't take long for dusk to come, and then night. There were many stars in the sky, the moon was shining brightly, and the lanterns ran caressingly through the windows of the compartment. Becky turned off the lamp and pronounced, but good night, good night, Michael replied. But he could not sleep. He thought about his life, and recently from a business trip. He also looked at the sleeping Becky for a long time. He liked her. He even imagined how great it would be to live with her. You come back from a hard service, and such a beautiful girl meets you, feeds you, caresses you, puts you to bed. And her children would be very beautiful and healthy. No, what are you thinking? She's almost married. How so? Alcoholics themselves. But it's her choice. Okay. What's that got to do with you? Yeah. And then you think she'll be waiting for you on another business trip or hot spot. No, and she won't miss you. She is. Oh, and beautiful. He only slept for 45 minutes, waking up at 6 o'clock am from his alarm clock. The man quickly headed for the restroom. The train outside the window was enough and over the fields. Were the orange colors riotous? At the mice in the restroom, he looked at himself in the mirror, brushed his teeth, went back in. Becky was already awake. Good morning, he smiled. Morning, Becky smiled at him and stretched sweetly. He couldn't help but notice the way the girl slid her eyes over his shoulders and biceps. Michael was in excellent physical shape and exercised regularly. He was wearing a calfskin shirt and blue shorts. How did you sleep? He asked. I always sleep well on the train. I get carsick. And you? I hardly slept at all. Really? Yes? Oh, that must be hard for you. Becky sympathized. Come on, Michael replied with boyish glee. I'm used to it. Do you want tea or coffee? Oh, thanks. Can I get a coffee?
Three, one that you walk well in. Fine as long as my teeth are cleaner. While the girl was in the restroom, and Michael took coffee from the conductor and returned to the compartment. He took a black one without sugar. The girl came back with a towel around her neck. She unbraided her braid and gathered her long, dark brown hair into a ponytail that reached almost to the end of her shoulder blades. She thanked Michael sat down across from him and pulled out more food sausage wrapped in foil, cheese, bread, croissant, and vegetables. They had an appetizing breakfast, chatting sweetly as the sun appeared from beyond the horizon. A new day was beginning. There was one more stop for three minutes before the terminus. Michael decided to go out for a smoke. When the train stopped, he left the compartment, closed the door, took a couple of steps and realized that he had forgotten his lighter on the table. He quickly returned, opened the door sharply and right into his hands fell Becky. The man held her beautiful body, his palms ending up in her Natalia's. Becky's head rested against his chest. She raised her head and their eyes met. It seemed to her that the space was filled with lightning. Oh, said the girl embarrassedly, pouring paint. Why did you come back? I thought you were going for a smoke. Yes, I was lost in words Michael, looking at the beautiful face of the girl. God, she's so beautiful. Then he came to his senses and said I left my lighter on the table. She gently began to push him away with her palms, and said laughing, and I wanted to go to the bathroom. And here you are once, said the door, but take the lighter quickly. It's a parking lot. It's only three minutes. Wait, and then on the platform and greedily pulling Michael, thought how it was lucky, I forgot the lighter. He remembered her big-eyed hands, as if he could still feel her spouse and her body. Becky watched him from the window. She thought of his strong arms, he also smelled so nice. She wanted to drown in that smell. She wanted him to hold her again. But not as an occasional traveler, but as a man in love. No, what can she do? She's been with Alexa a long time. What other people will think? And then he and her husband will be in the same unit. So you have to pull yourself together. It's better to be in his hands again and not think about anything. Michael came back smelling of tobacco. They looked at each other and smiled. They drove the rest of the way in silence. Becky pretended to be very interested in reading the book. Michael kept trying not to look at her, which was very hard for him. Soon they arrived at the final station. The man helped Becky to lower the bags. They stepped back a little. Well, I guess we should catch a car, make arrangements, Becky said, glancing at the drivers, who were already looking at them like kites. You know, do you want to go for a walk? Mike suddenly suggested. He felt as if the words were spoken by someone else. The girl looked at him in surprise, but in her eyes there was interest and a little coquetry. Let's take a walk. It's only four kilometers to grandmother's village. Let's walk along the field, it's going to be so beautiful. When I was a kid, I used to walk around the village all the time, I'll show you grandma's house. So your grandmother lives nearby. Yeah, why didn't you tell me before? Yeah, Michael scratched his head. The conversation wasn't working out. But it's clear that for a while the girl thought Michael really wanted her to go with him. He felt like a child waiting for his mom to hand him a present from Santa Claus. Let's go for a walk, said Becky. Oh, wait, what about my bags? You'll have a hard time carrying them, won't you? And they can leave them in the luggage room at the station, replied Mike. We'll walk in the village, then take the bus. We'll come back here pick up the bags and go to the unit. How's that sound? It's tempting. Alex doesn't get off till four o'clock anyway. What did he tell me? There's plenty of time. They left their bags in the luggage room and were given the number 215. Then Michael led her along the field along a road he had taken many times when he visited his grandmother. Very often he would ride his bike to meet the boys, dawn and see off the sunset. And this birch tree was the first time he kissed a girl. He was 13 at the time. They were walking, watching the tall grass move in the wind in a field in the distance was a forest. Michael used to tell if as a child. Grandma will probably be glad when she sees you, Becky said. Does she know you're coming or is it a surprise? Well, she died three years ago. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry, please. It was the first time she called him Mike since they'd been together. What's the matter? 
One minute it's the wife, one minute it's the grandmother. No, it's okay, Michael reassured her. It's not your fault. How could you have known? I didn't say anything. Anyway, I wanted to go to my grandmother's grave. I wasn't at her funeral because I was on a business trip. Then he paused, as if collecting his thoughts. It's weird, you're a strange girl. I'm taking you to my village for some reason. I told you I'm going to my grandmother's grave. Why am I suddenly taking you with me? You were not afraid of me. No, smiled the girl. I trust you. I feel that you are a good man and that you speak the truth. And if a man is a scoundrel, I can recognize it from a mile away. Becky said and lightly stroked his shoulder. Michael felt warm inside again. Believe me, for my 22 years I have seen different people in my life, and many of my beauty wanted to take advantage of. Well, you know, for what purposes? But I feel like you don't have that nasty stuff in you. You're a good person. Tell me more about your childhood. Are you that interesting to listen to? They moved on, and he kept feeling the touch of her hand on his shoulder. He felt warm inside from her voice, from the smell of her hair, from her look from her laughter. Becky, on the other hand, felt very calm, as if she was completely safe and could fear nothing more. Everything was getting softer inside her. She wanted to stroke his mighty arm and to stare into his eyes for a long time. And Michael talked merrily and nonstop about his childhood, about the village, about his grandmother. Becky laughed, wondered, laughed loudly, pushing Michael on the shoulder. He told about playing soccer with the boys one of the boys kicked the ball and broke the windows in Nikolaevich's house. He jumped out of the house and ran after them, swearing funny words. Then how Michael caught a big pike in the river and became the first guy in the village. How he tried pot and moonshine with his friends for the first time. How he fell in love with Anna and asked her out at night. How he and Ben made a bungee cord and jumped off it all summer long. She listened to him and listened to him. Slowly the houses of the village began to appear. I was thinking, Becky began, I guess we grew up in the same town, didn't we? Michael agreed. How come I've never met you before and never knew you? So I'm older than you. So what? How old are you? 30. Well, you're only eight years older than me. We must have crossed paths sometime. What school did you go to? Ninth, I was in fourth. What neighborhood did you live in downtown, you? I lived on Southside. You know where that is? Yeah, I do. It's a small town. That's what I'm saying. I'm surprised we haven't seen each other before. Becky. I left for military school when I was 18. You were only 10. How and where would we have crossed paths? Yes, while you were at home playing with dolls, I was already playing with boys in the yard and even tried cigarettes. Yeah, Becky said. I was very young. Do you know Ustinov? No, I don't. Well, he's a cab driver now, and he used to make fun of me. It's hard for you not to, Michael complimented. Becky laughed and blushed a little. Who else? Maybe you know someone named William Jensen. No, I don't. Or I taught Brunson. My best friend since we were in diapers. No. The man kept smiling. Jenna. Corver's got the whole crew. Well, Alex ended up there too. I don't know. I know Ethan Simmons. Yeah, and to think. Martin Nance, you know him? Have you ever talked to him? The man was surprised. Well, the other guys were with him. He's in one company or the other. He's a drug addict. Yeah, they say he threw himself out of a window a year ago. While he was in the hospital. Six. Congratulations, Michael said. Of all the mutual acquaintances in our town, the only one we have in common is Martin Nance, the junkie. It's nice when such wonderful people bring other wonderful people together. Becky started laughing very loud and long. Michael looked at her and smiled. He liked being funny to her. He wanted to hear her laugh more and more often, probably for the rest of my life. Oh, we're getting close to the village, aren't we? My grandmother's cottage was my grandmother's cottage, Michael said. What's wrong with it now? Becky asked. For three years it's been empty. My father took everything out of there and boarded up the doors. It was decided to sell the parents needed money. I help them as I can, but still not enough. Their paychecks are often late, and they have to pay the rent. 
They wanted to sell the house and put the proceeds into a mortgage. They put up an ad, but they haven't had a buyer in three years. Can you imagine how that could happen? And when I got back from my business trip, some guy came along. Tomorrow my father will come here, show him the plot and negotiate with him. Well, he already wants to buy it. So technically this plot is still ours, but soon it won't be. Now it makes me sad. Becky asked sympathetically. A little, said Michael. This is where my happiest moments were. I remember my grandmother's apple pies. I come running hungry in the evening, but I fly at them like locusts, eat everything. And she looks at me and smiles. Eat, eat, sweetie. Then I go on with the boys to run around and she sits down to cut a sweater for winter for me or my father. A tear glistened in the man's eyes. Commander, do you have a cigarette? Michael was awakened from his thoughts by an unpleasant shout. He looked to the right and saw two guys about 25 years old. They were sitting on a pile of firewood and seeing him and the girl headed in their direction. Why wouldn't they? Hence, asked Michael, trying to remain calm. Becky instinctively hid a little behind his back the young man approached and carelessly took two cigarettes out of Michael's pack. He was wearing a calfskin and no visor. The pungent odor of alcohol hit the captain's nostrils. It was obvious they had been drinking for more than a day. He gave his friend a cigarette and they smoked with matches. Not from around here themselves, asked the unpleasant villager. No, Michael said calmly. I grew up here. I've come for a walk around my hometown. I see. Listen, can I give you the whole pack of cigarettes to A? We've been sitting all day without a smoke. Michael was surprised by such an unexpected and impudent request and asked, Can't you buy a pack of cigarettes? The stall around the corner. Imagine, no fate. Stupid laughing is over, comrades. We're out of money, we drank it all. So give me a pack. Hey, buddy, how about I leave you a couple more cigarettes and we'll go? All right. Michael tried to speak neutrally and politely, but the rage inside him was beginning to curdle. You're holding us up. No, let's do it this way, the guy answered him. You give me a bundle for one of your girls and get the fuck out of here. Your girl's prettier. Becky was very scared, instinctively hiding behind Michael's back. He realized that a conflict was brewing, which apparently could not be avoided by peaceful means. Everything happened in a matter of seconds, in a flash, Michael unnoticeably grabbed the bully's hand, holding a knife. Then he made a throw, and he fell flat on the pavement like a rag doll. Michael pulled out the knife and broke his arm. He screamed, let go of my arm, asshole. Michael looked at his friend. Do you want to join us? It's not me. I think I'll go, he answered, frightened. And then he ran so that his heels glistened. The other one continued to lie on the pavement, his face was contorted with a grimace of pain. You're wondering, Michael smiled. Yes, go. You answered him that one. Okay. And now he gave him a little pressure on his elbow, and he squealed to the whole village. A couple of people came out of the neighboring houses to see what was going on. The guy suddenly became a baby voice. I surrender. I surrender. Let go of my arm. And the magic word. Please, that's not all, Michael said. Apologize to the girl. What do you want me to put more pressure on my hand? No, no, girl, please apologize to me and me and my friend. You know him. Michael looked at the frightened Becky. She was nodding with Chinili, but well said Michael and let go of his adversary. Go on. He kicked him so that he fell into a nearby ditch. The bully stood up helplessly, rubbing his arm and writhing in pain. He glared angrily at Michael and then headed after his friend, who was already a small dot. Somewhere on the horizon, Becky calmed down a bit and looked at Michael with loving eyes. They were silent for a while, looking at each other, and then looked away embarrassed. The man blushed and said, We were going to my grandmother's house. Yeah, yeah, let's go, Becky replied. Soon they approached the property. He opened the rusty lock of the gate inside everything was overgrown, tall weeds and weeds. The old blue two-story house was lost in paint, as if it was slightly askew and looked at them pitifully. Michael and Becky walked down the path to the gazebo. They sat down, he pulled a water bottle out of his backpack and offered Becky one. She thanked him and took a few gladders. 
Gradually, the summer heat began to kick in, and the moisture blissfully wafted down her beautiful body. Michael took out a cigarette and smoked thoughtfully. A rooster crowed in the distance, a breeze blew, mansions on the property. The man and the girl were silent for a long time. Michael was absorbed in his thoughts. Becky sat and thought that she would like to walk with him all day in the village and in the woods, listening to his interesting stories and laughing at the top of her voice. She hadn't felt this good in a long time. She liked him. Becky was very afraid to admit it to herself, but she could no longer deny the obvious and deceive herself. She liked him. And Alex was somehow pushed to the background, not even to the background, but to some very distant one. It was as if he had become a complete stranger to her. She didn't want to go to him, but Mike was so dear, so warm, so real. She looked at him with her hand on her cheek. For some reason, she wanted to ask him, where did you learn to do that? What don't you understand, Michael? You know the tricks of the trade. Becky said, embarrassed. I've only seen that in movies before, and here you are. And this floor indifferently answered Michael. And I've been practicing hand-to-hand -hand combat for six years. Wow, the girl exclaimed. Yes, my father brought me. You know where the museum is, don't you? Of course I do. Well, there was a school in the basement. I practiced until I was 18 years old. And in the army, continued the instructor. I had such a cool, also military. Such a stocky man with a bushy mustache and a mixed suit. Uncle Zach was his name. He'd been through Vietnam. He came back from a hot spot and decided to open his own section. He was a cheerful man, kind, kind, but strict. He praised me very much. Others even resented that I was his favorite. I won medals and cups in competitions. At home, my mom still has the whole wall in them. Quietly laughed Michael, and then continued standing there collecting dust. Why do they have to collect dust right away? Becky shared. You tried, fought, won. Well, yes, perhaps, agreed the man. Listen, did you visit Uncle Zach when you were at Mom and Dad's? Sure, that's a given. I come to see Uncle Vita every time I visit, standard procedure. He taught me a lot not only in terms of sports, but also in life. A wise man, so very wise. This time I came, I thought we'd do the old scheme in his coach's room. A couple of daisies and then we'd go back to our old ways. And he told me, Mike, I've given up drinking. Two years ago, I can still pour tea. I quit smoking too, by the way. Can you imagine, at 55 years old, a man just quit? Good for him. I'd like to quit smoking too. I don't drink very rarely anyway. And never got drunk. Michael summed up, smoking a cigarette and carefully put out the butt on the ground. Then he threw it into a rusty bucket that stood nearby and looked at Becky. Their gazes met again. She took her hand away from her face and put it on the table in the gazebo. Then she said to Michael, thank you for protecting me. Looking into her eyes, he touched her hand with his fingers and then placed his palm on it. Becky wanted to pull her hand away, but his palm was so nice, so hot. Michael could feel the girl struggling a little, but then he realized that she felt good when his strong hand touched her. For a while, they looked at each other in silence. A blush began to flood their cheeks. Finally, Michael said softly, so beautiful. You were made to be protected and cherished at all times. She felt a huge and pleasant wave arising in the center of her body, filling her with heat. Her heart beat more frequently. He lifted her palms, their fingers beginning to intertwine. She didn't resist. No, you can't do this, you can't do this. Becky thought. I have a boyfriend. I've been with him for six years, and Mike was the first time she'd ever seen him yesterday. But how can I be happy with him? I've never felt as good in six years as I did today in one day. And Michael squeezed her soft, lovely fingers tighter and tighter. He wanted her and he desired her. He longed to wrap his arms around her lovely body. Finally, Becky came to her senses and pulled her hand away from him, slightly embarrassed and blushing. The man's face became new. He turned away and nervously took out a cigarette, although he didn't really feel like smoking. What on earth am I doing? He thought, she has a fiancé, especially he's in the same unit as me. Why am I telling her all this? Why did I bring her here? God, what an idiot am I? And since we have a bus back to the station, 
Becky interrupted his musings. There's one at 12 o'clock. He looked at his watch. And you, you wanted to go to your grandmother's grave. We'll make it. Yeah, the cemetery's not far. Good. Why don't we go then? Let's go. Michael lit a cigarette. They left the gazebo. As he left, he closed the gate and looked at his grandmother's house one last time. Tomorrow it would be sold to another person. His warm memories from his childhood would remain only in his soul. He mentally said a warm goodbye to the house and they headed towards the cemetery. The village was deserted. Michael noticed that several houses were deserted. Such familiar places seemed so alien to him now. This was the end of a part of his life, of which he had many memories, good memories. He felt as if an invisible artist was erasing the forgotten frames of the movie of his life. He went on and on about his life, but all he could think about was the pleasant touch of her fingers. She was asking him something. They were looking at the countryside. An eggplant rushed past them. A new nine with the windows down. Music played loudly from them. They walked along the forest on a dusty road and soon found themselves in a cemetery. They walked along the graves for a while and ended up at Grandma Michael's grave. I'll wait for you there, Becky said and walked a little farther away. Okay. Grandpa and Grandma's grave were side by side. Their portraits stared at him silently from the granite stone. Grandpa Michael had died when he was five years old, he barely remembered him. His grandmother, on the other hand, had lived a very long time. Michael sat on a bench and thought about nothing. Nearby stood the old man's birch trees. When the warm summer wind blew, it became hot. Becky stood nearby near a monument. The sculpture depicted a weeping angel. The girl looked at it thoughtfully, and Michael approached her at the same time. It's a beautiful sculpture. Yes, agreed the man. Let's go, let's go. As they left the cemetery, they met a watchman who was sweeping up leaves and exchanged dry ones with him. Hello. They walked a little way down the road towards the village when suddenly Becky's phone rang. It was Alex. I'll answer it, she said. Michael agreed with her. Hello? Yeah, 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 I was driving all right. Where? Yeah, I'm in the neighborhood. So you said it was only at four o'clock. So I did. All right, I'll be there soon. What's wrong with your voice? Are you drunk again? No, look, she hung up on me. Michael looked at her and she sighed and said, I think you're drunk again. Oh my God, I am so sick of this. I can feel that he's drunk. I can feel it. And he's still lying to me. He just called me now. And it's 11 o'clock. I told him I'd be there at 8 o'clock. Nothing. You made it. You're fine. Do you need any help? Like I'm just there to drive food to his unit and put up with his drunken antics and wait for us to get an apartment that we may never get. God, I'm so tired of all this. Becky covered her face with her hands and cried. Michael was confused for a while. I don't know what to do. Then something nudged him and he hugged her. Becky clung to him and returned and sobbed, her tears staining his chest. He could feel the pain building up inside her. Michael held her beautiful body in his arms and could smell her beautiful hair. The girl was crying loudly. They stood in the middle of the woods near the road. The man had the feeling that they were some strangers among this lovely and endless nature. Why should I beg for care? Don't I deserve it? The girl read through her tears. Don't I do enough for him? Six years I'm with this turnover and nothing good. He only drinks and promises. And he'll quit drinking and marry me and we'll have apartments and children. Yeah, of course, I should have kids by now. All the relatives want grandchildren, the clock is ticking. And this one. With these words, another sobbing fit burst from her chest. Michael held her tighter. His chest was wet with her tears. The girl cried for a while longer, and then her sobs turned to short sobs. Michael had some tissues in his backpack, and he held them out to her. She wiped her red, crying face. I don't know why Michael took one napkin and began to wipe her tears in a fatherly and caring way. Suddenly she took his hand when it was near her cheek. Their gazes met, her eyes glistened and her lips were moist. No longer able to control herself, they merged in a long and passionate kiss. It was a riot of vibrant colors inside a waterfall, emotions of fever coming from the very heart. 
Becky hugged his huge back and he stroked her waist. His hands moved lower and lower, she didn't mind and clutched to him even tighter. At one point Becky pulled away from him, and he looked into her eyes and whispered, Let's go into the woods, she nodded silently. He sat with his back leaning against a tree, she was rolling on top of him. Her lovely head of gorgeous, thick, darkly pantsed hair was on his chest. Becky was beautiful. Michael covered her with a windbreaker that he had in his backpack in case it rained. She felt warm and good with him. She seemed happy. He stroked her chin with his fingers. Once in a while Becky kissed them lightly. It felt so good for the two of them. They were silent for a very long time, enjoying each other's company. And then the girl laughed lightly, stroked his chest, and said we didn't make the bus at 12 o'clock. We didn't make it. Michael agreed. What time is the next one? I think it's at 14 or 13.30. But what does it matter now? How do you feel about going on duty, comrade captain, said Becky, and they laughed together. How does the song go? Airplanes first. Yes, and the girls after that. Michael finished for her. Well, you know, you can't take a song for granted. I've been stuck with airplanes for six years. Kate got divorced and that was it. You never had anyone else after her? No, just one-off stories that didn't last. There was this one girl. I fell in love with her, started courting her. You know the usual, but she didn't want any of that. She just laughed at me, that's all. Then I had no time for business trips, hotspots. I was making money. And my personal life was kind of wiped out. And then suddenly you. They were silent. Then Michael asked, tell me, why did you love your LX? I don't know exactly, Becky thought. Probably at 16, when he kissed me for the first time. It was some kind of hormonal thing. You know a crush. Alex told me how he felt all the time. He gave me compliments, flowers, wooed me beautifully. He even wrote poems. Can you imagine? He told me how much he loved me and wanted to have children with me. And he was sure to marry me. But first, the military school, and then this coup for an apartment. I believed him, I believed him, I waited for him always, because I had to. A woman should wait for a man because he's good, he's a provider. That's the way I was brought up, I studied, he studied. We saw each other once, we rented apartments to live together. I thought we have these feelings forever. And then it became more of a habit or something, you know? You didn't think about leaving him. Michael interrupted her. Becky was silent for a moment, and then she answered, I did and sometimes I wanted to. Did you? I even tried to leave him. But he'd come back with a huge bouquet of roses, get down on his knees, and say, Becky, love, I'm sorry. I believed again. I thought that this time he would change and everything would be different. But no, it's the same old pattern. Everything goes well for a while. Then it's back to drinking, swearing, blaming me for everything. It's like a merry-go-round. I feel like such a fool now. You're not stupid, Becky. You're not stupid, Michael said, stroking her hair and kissing the top of her head. And then there's my relatives and my mom and my grandmother and my friend's grandmothers all pushing me. Come on, what are you talking about? He drinks. So what? Who doesn't drink nowadays? At least he's not cheating. You have to learn the military on the take and then, look, up to major and maybe even colonel. What prospects and an apartment? Which of the suitors has an apartment now? Go with him, accept it. Nothing, nothing. It's just his youthful stupidity that will pass. Be patient. That's it, Mike, be patient, be patient. Wait, wait, wait. And I'm waiting like a fool and bear with it. Mike, when will you live? To love, when, when to babysit and take the kids to the garden. Oh, I'm so sick of all this. They were silent and he stroked her hair. Then the girl continued, and you and I have everything. That's how ashamed I am, Mike. I cheated on my fiance with you. What will people think when they find out? They'll say I'm some kind of, you know. There'll be rumors all over town. Michael put his palm on her cheek, turned to face her and said, I don't care what anybody thinks, you know. I don't care. Let them think what they want to think. All people have opinions. Nobody forbids them to express their opinions. But you can just not listen to it, turn it off and do what your heart desires. 
After these words, they merged again in a long and tender kiss. There was silence, birds were singing, a cuckoo was heard in the distance. After the kiss, they were silent. And then Becky asked him, What story am I to you? What do you mean? But you said you had one-off stories there after your ex-wife. What if I'm a story to you too? Taking me to the country, charming me. What if this is all a cunning plan to seduce me? Becky, really? No, honestly, I swear to you. Mike, then what do we do now? I got a fiancé, you're in the service with him. In one unit, I'll live in this military town for a month and go to him, and then I'll go to you. I've never had anyone but Alex. I've never had a lover. I don't know what I'm gonna do now. Oh, I don't know. Not a slutty woman, I guess. Becky, let's take things as they come. Right now, you and I are going to take the bus. Then you call Alex, get the car, drive separately from me so no one gets suspicious about us. I'll be there later. You can text me tonight and we'll meet. How interesting. I'll be in a show or a movie or inside a book I read as a kid. Secret dates, fiances, lovers. I never thought I'd go on one of those. And here you were a random hitchhiker, Becky said, and gently slapped his chest with her palm. Let's walk slowly toward the bus. Oh, I don't feel like it, the girl said, I don't feel like it. I'd lie around with you all day long. So good, let's stay here for another five minutes. Come on, agreed the man. The bus pulled up, sighing all around him. The clubs where Becky and Mike sat down. Passengers with grim faces looked at them in surprise as if they were foreign elements. Michael held out money to the conductor and she gave him change. The bus bounced on the bumps. Becky stared out the window pensively and it was hot. He could feel the sweat beating on his forehead and his back getting wet. The seat beneath them had already warmed in the sun, now burning his buttocks slightly. How far are we going to go? Becky asked. About 15 minutes, Michael answered. They were silent the rest of the way. They arrived at the train station where they had gotten off the train this morning. The rest of the way, they drove in silence. They arrived at the station where they got off the train this morning. It felt like they had lived a lifetime together in just one morning. The man lit a cigarette. The bus driver approached him and gestured for a lighter. He was a thin man in his 40s. He had a thick black brush moustache, sticking out of wrinkles on his face. He was dressed in a brown shirt with stains under and under his arms and black pants. He dryly thanked and stepped aside, and Becky looked at Michael with loving eyes. He was so masculine, so tall, so strong. Her body could still feel it, his strong hands rough and caressing. He was beautiful. Mentally Becky compared him to her Alex, and the latter was clearly losing on all counts. She didn't want to go to her fiance's house. She wanted this day to never end. Michael finished his cigarette, and they headed to the locker room to pick up their bags. He slung his green army bag over his shoulder and took Becky's heavy bags in his hands. Can you carry them? The girl asked. Where would I go? The man smiled. They headed towards the cab drivers. Seeing them, an elderly Indian with a characteristic accent shouted, Guys, we need a cab. Where are we going? Let's make the bags nice. He opened the trunk and made an inviting gesture. How can you refuse such a service? Michael thought to himself with a smile. The cab driver helped him to put the bags and then opened the door Becky got in. Only the girl will ride. I'm not going, Michael said. If you say so, agreed the cab driver. Where to? To the military unit near here, answered Becky from the car. Let's kick it, yeah, said Michael. How much, bro? Special for you. The price is $5. I'm telling you it's a very good deal. You go that way. If you go that way, everybody's gonna tell you $7, $8. I'll take the girl like a magic carpet and my mom. I swear. Michael smiled, pulled out his wallet, and gave the driver the bill he needed. After thinking a bit, he added the cabbie and another $1, said, and this is for you for the service. Your brother from the heart. Well, let's go. Wait, a couple minutes asked Michael. He leaned over to the car window. Becky looked at him. But for now, she said. For now, I'll text you tonight. Okay, be careful. He stepped away from the car and signaled the driver to go. Then he walked a little farther and negotiated with another cab driver. After much haggling, 
Michael still agreed to ride for $7. The Armenian didn't cheat, Mike thought. It's nice that there are still honest people in our time. Meanwhile, Becky was driving and looking out the window. The Armenian turned out to be chatty. He kept saying something to her, and she rarely answered him, aha, aha. What's wrong with you? She looked at the familiar scenery, but everything seemed foreign to her. Without Michael Becky, she remembered his strong arms, his kind and honest eyes. She wished this day would end soon so she could call or write to him, so she could hear his voice again or feel a mirror. Listen, the sergeant at the checkpoint told him. Me, Captain Morris. Here's the paperwork. Michael held out his military ID card to him. You should have your orders in there. Take a look. The surgeon looked at the computer and clicked a couple of times, then tapped the keyboard. He looked intently at the monitor and said, yes, there is. Come on in, Captain. The surgeon handed Michael's military ID card back, and then a private shouted in a military manner. A young kid of 18 years old, skinny stubby with glasses, ran up to him. Probably joined the service recently. He set off clumsily and looked at the surgeon over his shoulder. I need to talk. Escort the comrade captain to the officer's barracks. Do you know where it is? Executed exactly. Yes, comrade staff surgeon Michael went through the checkpoint. Soon he went into his room and started ironing his uniform to change and head to the colonel. Becky arrived before he did. She had been told that the chief warrant officer Loud Loud was in the warehouse, and she needed to wait a bit. The sergeant called and reported to the petty officer that his fiancé had arrived. Alex showed up about ten minutes later. He had a wrinkled look on his face, his soft uniform removed. She hadn't seen him a couple months, but it appeared he changed beyond recognition in that time. His eyes had gotten small and swollen. He put on a couple extra pounds. His potbelly was showing under his uniform. He disgusted her. Becky, my darling, my darling. His clumsy paws rested bulky on her shoulders. He reached for her with his lips. But Becky turned away and planted a kiss on her cheek. He smelled disgusting. Are you drunk again? She said to him instead of greeting him. Becky, darling, in a deluded tongue began the petty officer. What do you mean, drunk again? Well, we had a few drinks with William. That's how much he put his index finger and thumb together in a characteristic gesture. I swear to you, it's the end of the week. My God, it's the end of the week. Come on, Becky. Then he said in a nasty, lustful tone of voice, you will. You will. I haven't seen you in so long. Come on, you and me. Well, he reached out his hands to her again, trying to touch her charms. But Becky coldly and with irritation pushed him away and said today is Wednesday. Alex stared at her, uncomprehending. Slightly, staggered to her feet. Wednesday. Wait, like Wednesday. And I thought, well, Wednesday is a little Friday, here we go. Come on, come on, your Alex missed you. That's what Becky said out loud. Alex jerked back in surprise. The two soldiers near the checkpoint turned their heads in her direction. Becky noticed this is what she continued young man. There was a new metallic intonation in her voice, previously uncharacteristic of her. We had a deal that you quit drinking or at least around me you don't drink because it disgusts me. It was on me. Look when I'm talking to you. It did or it didn't. It did. Gave in to Alex. So, Becky went on. She felt like someone else was speaking for her. You broke the deal again. I don't like that at all. So I'm leaving now. You're staying here. Call me when you're sober. Also apologize to Becky, not Becky and me. I'm out of here. You can keep drinking with your Daniel. I don't care. Becky turned around and walked with wide steps away from the military unit, leaving the chief warrant officer and the soldiers near the checkpoint in mute indignation. One of them said to the other Le, and she is cooler than our company commander. This one definitely give me a cigarette. The senior warrant officer stood for several minutes, looking at one point and did not understand what had just happened. He was already quite drunk and alcohol began to cover him more and more. Finding his feet, he turned around and headed back towards the checkpoint. Everything in front of his eyes went bad. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the soldiers staring at him with smokes and cigarettes. What are you staring at? 
angrily asked the petty officer. Is there a problem? Not at all. Comrade petty officer. Almost unanimously echoed the soldiers. Look, I loudly loud headed through the checkpoint towards the warehouse, thinking to take to hell. What's gotten into her? She was always so docile. So what if she had a drink? She didn't know what got into her. All her life she's been a good and obedient girl. And now she's got her fiancé in a scandal outside the army station. Could it be Michael had that effect on her? She thought of him again and a pleasant warmth spread through her body. The girl smiled and the bags were no longer so heavy, the sun so hot and the situation so unpleasant. Everything was suddenly good. Morris looked at himself in the mirror. The uniform had everything laid out all back on his shoulders, four stars and stripes. What's a captain's when? How many? Asterisks? Five. Becky's voice echoed in his head. He remembered her smile, her eyes the gentle voice remembered how good it felt to stroke her body and kiss her lips. How he wished he could see her again. She'd probably really like me in uniform, Michael thought. Then he put on his cap and left the room. It was the first sign of dusk outside. A platoon ran past the barracks in formation. The captain passed the platoon and went to the colonel. Along the way he met soldiers who stopped, made military greetings, and said Zdravlia Zdravlia. The captain silently answered them with a nod of the head. When he reached the headquarters, he reported to the secretary that he had arrived at the colonel's office. The secretary knocked on the office and invited him in. Out of the corner of his eye, Michael saw a sign on the door Colonel Adams. Michael joked to himself about the most appropriate initials for the Russian army. Entering the office, he saw a large bald Shelkov man slightly over 50, who was concentrating on his computer and poking at the keyboard with fingers that looked more like Bavarian sausages. Michael stopped near the door, holding his cap in his hand, and said hello. Comrade Colonel. The latter took his eyes off the computer and looked at M.O.R.I.S. in surprise, then smiled and shouted good naturedly, Zoravi Zoravi Vidali Elephant's Petals. Then they both laughed loudly, and the Colonel continued, Mike, my dear, are you? I am Comrade Colonel. The Colonel started with open arms and walked towards the captain. They embraced, and the Colonel kissed him twice, firmly and masculinely on both cheeks and then began to shake his hand, smiling in 32 teeth on his brow. And what a wind you got here, motherfucker. Come on, sit down and have a seat. Michael sat down and put his cap on the table. Squeal, shout for our health. Thank you, comrade colonel, I won't refuse. But Mike, let's not buy the charter. Colonel, colonel, got me here itish what an important man and loud and dispersed. Laughing. I remember you in training school, you were like this. The colonel showed his little finger and cheeks. Then he retracted his cheeks, his face became like the face of a huge carp, which made Morris even more cheerful. And now there you are waving like that, Captain, Captain, smile, your shoulders are like that, and look soon you'll be walking sideways to my office. Oh Mike, Colonel Adams reached for the bottle of whiskey in the first drawer of his desk. The captain laughed and smiled. He was very happy to see his good old teacher. The colonel pulled out a large bottle of expensive whiskey. Michael had never seen such a thing. He had. The colonel proudly tapped the bottle with his palm. From Australia. Recently he and my daughter came to my birthday party. And he's a guy, a beat it guy. With these words, the colonel raised a finger in the air. It's not that easy. We'd like to see more of them in the armed forces. Otherwise, it's this junk. The man pointed to his old computer with a large monitor. But it's just nerves, not work. All right, he said, and started pouring whiskey. Come on, dear, to us, to you and to the special forces. Cheers. The officers clinked glasses and put them on the table. Michael felt the whiskey burning his throat. Then a pleasant warmth went down his body with a lemon. Asked the colonel, comrade colonel, I don't snack after the first one. With these words they laughed even louder, because they remembered a funny incident from their youth. So, comrade captain, you remind me of those times. Smiling, jokingly wagging his finger, told him Adams and is. All right, thought the colonel, and began to shift a little to a more serious tone. 
Think how you and I came to such a remote place. I thought you served somewhere near Moscow. That's right. And then a business trip like a business trip. Really? Asked the colonel, pouring the second one. How are ours? Yes, things are going well. The task set by the leadership is being fulfilled. Difficult. It all happened. I was stuck in that country for three years. I didn't even take a vacation. At least you got a bonus, right? Well, thank God. What about here? An order is an order. My grandmother's village is nearby. I never thought I'd have to live here. As they say, God works in mysterious ways. That's for sure. And how are you here, Comrade Colonel? Oh, Mike, I beg your pardon, you've taken possession. Comrade Colonel, Comrade Colonel, you I am for my Semyonovich. Got it, got it? Confused, said Michael. I have nothing special too. That's all. You and I are like ants. Wherever they tell us to go, that's where we go. How about a third? No, Simeonovich, thanks, I don't want to. What do you think? I'll have a drink with your permission. Comrade Captain. And Adams laughed again. Then he poured himself another 50, drank it in one gulp. He wrinkled his nose a little and said, wow, what a drink. 15 years old. Come on, Mike, how do you live? Not married, kids. The captain was embarrassed. He remembered Becky's hair and her soft lips. He really wanted to hug her. Maybe he should call her after his talk with the colonel. No, Semyonovich didn't get married, Michael sighed. Why not? You're such a guy, handsome. Didn't you have a what's her name? The colonel began to snap his fingers, trying to remember the name. Kate helped him Morris. That's right, Kate, white-haired. I was the one who came to see you, the pretty one. I thought you were there with her. Why didn't it work out? Yes, Semyonik sighed. I married her. But as soon as I got married, I got divorced. Six years I've been single. Betrayed. The colonel asked with understanding. That's right. The colonel shook his fist at the air. Well, time heals. There's no one in sight. No, said Michael, feeling like he was lying. Well, well, it's a matter of time. I got there okay. Oh, by the way, I met a girl on the road. The captain tried to keep his voice neutral, afraid to reveal his feelings for Becky. Can you imagine, she had to be in the same honor said that she was on her way to the groom. Is that some kind of soldier? No. Senior warrant officer loudly loud, said Michael, trying to hide his disgust at that name. Do you know him? Sure, I've known him for six months. And what can you say about him? What are you interested in? Colonel Michael asked, surprised, and realized that he was about to crack, so he tried to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm just curious. It's a weird coincidence. Wait, you said you're his fiancé. Yeah, he has a wife. Why a fiancé? Michael turned pale. He was ready to fall to the ground in shame. So he slept with a married woman and she cheated on him. An act unworthy of an officer's honor. So Becky lied to him. She was actually married to Alex. And if she was lying, why? Did she really want to cheat on him? Or maybe she wasn't going to see him at all? Questions like angry bees swirled in Morris's head. But the colonel interrupted his thoughts. But yes, he has a wife and two children. He told me so himself. It's in his personnel file, too. Mike, why are you looking so pale? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Out of breath, Michael said. What's his wife's name? Oh, God forbid I remember. I remember Becky. Oh yeah, Becky. The girl on the train was called Becky, too. So much for coining words, Michael said. Well, that's her then. Only why was the bride called that all of a sudden? Decided maybe to remember her youth on her wedding night? Colonel Captain laughed, suddenly felt a burning jealousy in her chest. Strange these women damn them understand. So, all right. The colonel lightly slammed his palms on the table. Soon the tale will be told. But not soon the service will work out. I'll be sitting here to deal with this bandera. Adams pointed to the computer, a mountain of orders to sort out. You go get some rest. Check in with the major tomorrow. At 10 o'clock he will tell you what's going on. Got it? That's right, Michael mumbled, barely moving his lips, but that's it. Good to see you. Good service to you, comrade captain. If you need anything, come on in. 
My doors are always open to you. Captain Morris walked out of headquarters, having a bad dream about sleeping with the chief warrant officer's wife. He thought, that's a hell of a thing to do. But damn it, with a very pretty ensign's wife. What's the difference? If anyone in the unit finds out, it'll be such a scandal. My God, what was I thinking? My head's all fucked up. I was imagining things. I believed her, and the woman just wanted to have fun. Of course, she's got a fallen husband, right? And here I am a captain, tall, handsome, strong. How could she not sleep with me? Oh, what a fool I was. Michael had dinner and spent the rest of the day in his room. He tried watching a movie on his laptop, but all his thoughts were only of her. Inside was a mixture of feelings of love and bitterness, jealousy, annoyance, shame and anger at himself. After all, she was going to live in the town for a month. Becky would be traveling to it. Who can find out then what will happen? And how am I supposed to look that guy in the eye now? Maybe he's not an alcoholic at all, but a decent warrant officer. Everything else is just gossip and rumors. The colonel didn't say anything about him, right? Hello, comrade petty officer. I slept with your wife in the woods. How's that? It's like a joke, for God's sake. Michael chased these thoughts in his head, lying on the bed with his hands behind his head. It was already 12 o'clock, but he didn't want to sleep. Tomorrow he would be up at 5. Suddenly, a cell phone registered on the nightstand. It was her. Gathering his strength, he picked up the phone and coldly said hello. Hi. Once again that gentle voice ripped his heartstring apart. You're awake. No in a cold, angry tone communicated Michael. How are you fine, and you? I've been thinking about you all day. What's wrong with you? You're so tense, you're doing fine. The man was silent for a long time and then asked, why did you lie to me? What are you talking about? Mike, I sincerely do not understand what you mean. Let's be more specific. Becky was scared. That Mylaud is not your fiance, he's your husband. What Becky marveled at, I told you we're not married. He keeps asking me to marry him, but we never did. You have two kids with him. You hit it. Mike, have you been drinking? You don't sound like yourself, talking nonsense about your relationship. Alex, I told you everything as it is, and I was honest and frank with you. You're a mother of two children, and you let yourself sleep with another man. You're such a righteous one. The girl lost her temper. Let's say I was even a mother. So what? Let's say I was even a mother. So what? What are you, some kind of saint? You saw a girl younger than yourself, you tried to woo her. Told her touching stories about her grandmother and her childhood. You wooed her. And then I burst into tears. And you, Menetep and Bang, and dragged her into the woods. Isn't that right? The man was silent. In a way she was right. That's right. And something tells me. Even if I told you I was a mother of two, it wouldn't stop you. Michael was silent again, and she was right again. Why don't you say something? You've lost your tongue. Becky, you're not interested in anything else. No shame, no conscience. Look how interesting you've made me look. And now he's claiming I'm some kind of a dishonest person. You know what, Mike, I thought much better of you. Goodbye. I guess you and I had a one-time thing going on after all. I'm sorry. I was kind of hoping for more than that. Then tears came to the girl's eyes. There was a lump in her throat. God, I'm such an idiot. A month had passed since that conversation, or maybe a year, he didn't know. Everything appeared gray and dull to him. Michael knew that once a week Becky came to see the chief warrant officer. He tried not to cross paths with her, though his heart ached and his soul ached to tell her how he felt. However, he tried to bury them alive, but they inexorably burst from the bowels of his soul and grabbed his heart fiercely. In his chest pinched longing for the rack on the tape flashed days of service, the schedule of the day. Everything by the hour, everything by the minute. Routine sucked him in. But in his spare time he thought of her, remembered that fabulous day they spent together. There were times when he forgot about her, and it was strange to him that he thought about her for hours, but she suddenly became the centrifugal force of his thoughts. His whole being yearned for her. Several times he wanted to call her, talk to her normally, explain everything. 
maybe try again, or at least part on a good note. But he couldn't. His fingers were already dialing the cherished phone number, but something stopped him at the last moment. It was about the same thing. At first she was very angry with Mike and could not forgive him, then she began to long for him. She remembered the day she had spent with him too, and thought it was the most beautiful day she had had in the last six years. She wanted to go to him, but her feminine pride prevented her from dialing his phone number. No, she thought, if he was really a decent man and would fall in love with me as I did with him. Let him dial me first and apologize. And if he's just another dog, let him go to the woods. There aren't many of them. Well, there aren't many, handsome, tall, handsome, handsome, nice, with money, with an apartment. A captain, probably a colonel. What rank comes after captain? I'll have to ask Alex. Alex called her two days after such an unpleasant incident at the checkpoint, swore and swore that he would never drink again in his life, except a little bit on holidays. He told her he loved her and had been waiting for her all this time. And Becky believed him again, since she'd known him for six years. And Mike was the first time she'd ever seen him. Alex, he's kind of her own person. She consoled herself. Yeah, he drinks, sure. But what man doesn't drink? We should ask him about the apartment. What's the good news? Nothing, nothing. He'll take his exams in the fall. He'll go to study to be a lieutenant. And we'll live. But we're in this unit too. Will she have to avoid him? Alex came home from work. He hadn't had a drink in a month. Anyway, Becky didn't smell alcohol on him. She was making him dinner. They would chat about the day and then go to bed. Sometimes they had routine, monotonous, ordinary sex. Like all life after it Alex would wheeze and Becky would pull the blanket up to her chin and stare at the ceiling. There were times when she would quietly cry herself. I don't know why, or rather she did. She didn't like this life. She didn't like it. She didn't like making him food every night. She didn't like everything. She often thought back to when they were in the woods with Michael and compared. He was so soft, so careful, and yet he was skillful at showing his strength. He enjoyed her body and tried to give pleasure to her. Alex on the other hand was thinking more about just satisfying his animal interests, and then fall asleep. Lately she hadn't slept for a long time, because she was alone with herself at night, and she liked it. But okay, I'll dump Alex and go to him. We'll be in love for three years, and then it'll be the same routine. Everything changed abruptly one day, which was a fireworks display of strange and ridiculous events. Usually Becky would sit in the apartments studying her books before her husband's service. Sometimes going for a walk to the local park, she was preparing for her final year at the institute. According to estimates, she was going for a red diploma and really didn't want to ruin her reputation. However, she realized that first a student works for credit, and then vice versa but she decided to be reassured and to prepare for the new academic year in order to be a head above her classmates. Besides, one of the professors hinted to her about graduate school, which interested her a lot. So she lay peacefully on the couch and read a thick textbook. Periodically, she would underline something with a pencil and text with her girlfriend, and the windows were open wide open because it was a hot summer day and she wanted to cool it down a bit. Suddenly, her cell phone rang an unfamiliar number popped up on the display. Again, probably they will sell me loans. Annoyed, she thought, and picked up the phone. Hello, Becky, asked a male voice. Who is this? Surgeon of the Wells is concerned from the military unit. We have some kind of an emergency related to senior warrant officer Loud, your husband, that is. Could you, uh, could you come over for some clarification? Yeah, yeah, Becky's worried. How did you get my number? Captain Morris, and he's in the neighborhood. Can I give him a message? No, not necessary. Coldly, Becky said. At the same time, feeling a pleasant exultation inside. Her lower abdomen healed sweetly. I'm on my way. Stand by. In the meantime, there were some very interesting events going on in the unit that required her participation. And it all started with the firing range. Captain Morris was watching through binoculars as the men hit their targets. It was the heat of summer. He could feel a rivulet of sweat dripping from under his cap. The air was filled with shots from Kalashnikov rifles. Morris looked at one platoon. 
For some reason there were not enough soldiers in the positions, there should be 12 men, but there were only seven. Michael approached the animal and through the noise of gunfire said, Comrade Lieutenant, I am Comrade Captain. Why do you not have enough men in position? I can't know mages. Suddenly a sergeant ran up to them, and panting Vesia voice said Comrade Captain, Comrade Lieutenant, permission to report. Permission granted, replied Morris. The privates as well as the corporal are still in the ammunition depot. The non-commissioned officer was left in charge. Chief Warrant Officer Laub refused to give us assault rifles. He said that there were no more assault rifles, we were not entitled to any. I told him that everything should be enough, because yesterday you, Comrade Lieutenant, checked everything together with him. And there's an order from Comrade Major to hold a training session at the firing range. So, boldly asked Morris. Comrade Chief Warrant Officer refused to give us the required automatic rifles, closed the ammunition depot and went in an unknown direction. The lieutenant swore hard. Morris with a bitter intonation said, He who serves in the army does not laugh in the circus. So what do you want to do? Asked the sergeant, the lieutenant and the captain. They looked at each other. Michael said, Lieutenant, continue with the drill. Sarge, what's your last name? Sergeant Wells. Comrade Captain. Got it. Do you know where the petty officer is? Could it be him? He's often at the ensign's place. Is it in the hangars where we keep the cars? Come on, how do we visit him? Take me there, Comrade Captain. Let's go. The captain followed the sergeant. To his left, soldiers were lying down and shooting at targets. After about 10 minutes, they were outside the lightly lived in anger. It was semi-dark inside. The captain and sergeant headed toward the entrance. As the captain approached, he heard laughter and smelled a strong odor of alcohol and tobacco. Even though there was a no smoking sign on Anger's door. Sarge, there's a place to stay. The captain went inside the Angara and started walking along the rows of barrels and crates. He heard the end of the conversation. And I say to him, what 300 liters of diesel paste do you want? Death by Dacha. This was followed by a silly and loud laughter. Going around the corner, the captain saw the following picture. At a simple table with iron legs, preserved from the Soviet times on two stools, sat Chief Warrant Officer Loud and Warrant Officer Daniel. On the table was shot newspaper, on which stood two bottles of moonshine jar, pickles, sprats, a loaf of black bread, cucumbers, tomatoes, and green onions. The Warrant Officer's shirts had been reached. They held smoking cigarettes in their hands. The men were heavily intoxicated, though the clock showed only 12. Seeing the captain, Warrant Officer Daniel clumsily put the cigarette in the ashtray, then tried to stand up, but apparently from severe alcohol intoxication fell to the concrete floor, laughing, spreading his legs like a clown in a circus. The ensign loudly turned his head away, and as if not noticing the captain, continued smoking. The captain looked at Petty Officer Loud. Stocky, clean-shaven, with a swollen face and a red nose. His eyes and lips were more like and awkwardly cooked dumplings. Of what she found in him, it was like this. Captain Morris's first impression had never previously crossed paths with him on duty, but now it felt as if he was seeing him in his true guise. Finally, the captain couldn't stand it any longer and yelled Daniel and loud. How do you make sense of this? By this time, Daniel clumsily stood up and staggering on his feet through his thick gray mustache, said, hello, I wish you healthier. We've seen the petals on an elephant. Morris bellowed. Why are you sitting and drinking moonshine in the middle of the service? I answer according to the regulations. Comrade Captain Daniel blamed me. The military enlistment office is to blame, answered Morris. Sit down, sit down calmly, loud said to him loudly. The ensign looked at the captain in confusion, then at his drinking companion, and clumsily sat down. Comrade Petty Officer, respect the chain of command. I am the senior officer here. Why didn't you stand up and salute according to the regulations? Maybe I'm not supposed to. What did you say? Said Morris. Well, say it again. You heard perfectly well. Conley said loudly loud and put out his cigarette then rolled on the wall and folded his hands on his stomach. What did you come here for? 
You're supposed to be at the shooting range, aren't you? Comrade Chief Warrant Officer, you seem to forget. Hardly containing his rage, said the captain. Yes, it's you who forget everything. I've been in this unit for almost five years, and you arrived a month ago. Everything goes through me here, you understand? And you're so sidetracked. Morris's face, beating loud's thunder, continued to grow insolent. Come on, what are you gonna do to me? You hit me, you'll be out of here like a champagne cork. Nobody's gonna believe you anyway. I got it. I'll believe you. Suddenly there was a voice. Everyone turned around and saw Sergeant Coloso. He looked bravely at Loud. And I'll believe it, he repeated the sergeant. I told you to wait outside. Why don't you follow orders? Asked Morris. But in his heart he was glad that Ludden had decided to support him. Yes, because it is no longer possible. Comrade Captain started that one. Then there are no machine guns. Then there is a shortage of boots. Then the uniform is the wrong size. I have soldiers complaining all the time. We've been stuck for an hour today. I was proving to him that there are machine guns. I've been on contract in this unit for two years. And frankly, I'm getting a little tired of it. You asshole. Loud grabbed an empty bottle of moonshine and wanted to smash its head at the well remembering the lessons of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Morris hit the elder with the edge of his palm near his wrist, and he instantly dropped the bottle. Then Michael grabbed him by the wrist and took a small step and twisted his arm painfully. Let go of my hand, you bastard, shouted Graham and, kneeling down. Handle by the book, Morris bellowed at him. The surgeon at arms was startled by what he saw and flinched. The captain did it in a second. For a while, they didn't even realize what had happened. But Loud, in spite of the pain, remained stubbornly silent. Morris pressed harder on his hand and said, did not change his mind to address the statute in a machine voice, loudly repeated the captain. Petty officer wheezed his face became new eyes glistened with tears of pain. For a while, he was still screaming, then began to gather the necessary thoughts and said, comrade captain, my fault let go of my hand please, it hurts. Morris let go of his hands, Loud fell to the floor and grabbed his wrist. He resembled a wounded bear. Morris adjusted his cap, then looked over his left shoulder at Daniel and said, Comrade Warren Officer, I am Comrade Captain. So we're gonna clean up the warehouse, clean up the liquor, throw out the liquor. Do you understand? Yes, Comrade Captain. Permission to proceed. Permission granted. Then he wanted to give an order to the man who was still writhing on the floor in pain, but he was interrupted by a voice from outside. Comrade Petty Officer, Comrade Petty Officer. Then everyone listened to the sound of footsteps and a soldier Comrade Petty Officer walked in. Oh, he saw Loud on the floor and was surprised. Quickly he looked around at the participants of the scene. Suddenly he saw the captain standing at attention and said Zdorovi Zdorovia, Comrade Captain, We've seen your health. As a private reports, I was looking for Comrade Petty Officer. There is some citizen at the checkpoint with two small children, she says. His wife, Becky thought Michael, and his heart beat faster. He became agitated, but tried to look calm on the outside and answered the private. You said there are no visits now. Yes, Comrade Captain told her, and me and the surgeon. But she stands her ground, he says. She hasn't been in touch for two years. She already thought he was dead or missing. She came and asked loudly if he served in this unit. And we didn't say anything. So she showed us photos of the joint, he says. My husband. I've been looking for him for two years, at least for ten minutes. Bring him to me to make sure he's alive and well. And then I'll come when I can. Comrade Sergeant, I gave the okay, so I'm here. Playdate Michael, a popular personality, said the captain, leaning over him. Let's go to the checkpoint to sort things out. Or do you need to be taken by the handle? No way. Comrade Captain Parr, the petty officer answered him. I'll walk myself. Well, that's good, replied the captain of the wells. I'm going back. Take the men, go to the firing range. Will you swap assault rifles with someone? Tell the lieutenant, I ordered it and there is. Come on, petty officer, let's see what you've got there. What are the secrets of the Madrid court? In the Russian army, 
Morris came out of the checkpoint and saw a woman standing nearby. She had a white shawl on her head. She looked about 30 years old. She wore a simple black dress. She had a full build, sneaky disgusting. A second chin spread out. She resembled a chicken on a net that had been suddenly kicked off the farm. And that one now wandered clumsily through the woods. By the hand, the woman was holding a little girl who was picking her nose thoughtfully. And next to her a boy was running merrily kicking pebbles. Hey, hey don't run. Who did I tell? Morris headed toward the woman. At that time a door opened behind him and out came loud. His gaze met the woman's eyes and she leaned over to the girl and said Nancy, sunshine, stay here, okay. Now mommy and daddy will talk. That's a clever girl, don't run on the road. The woman swaggered and gait went to the petty officer as if not noticing the captain on the way. Then she started a scandal. What about you, Betty? Well, look at you, you showed up. We haven't forgotten. Bread and salt to you, comrade chief warrant officer. The woman made a comical and grotesque bow. Where have you been? Cattle? Why didn't you send money to the kids? Who promised to pay the rent? I thought you'd been killed in a hot spot somewhere. And here he is, sitting in the middle of nowhere and not a care in the world. Excuse me, citizen. Morris turned to her. Who are you? Someone tiredly, someone tiredly, she exclaimed. Wife, I'm the wonder in feathers. May I see your papers? For God's sake. Here's your passport, it's stamped. Here's his marriage certificate, his children's birth certificates. Twins Christina and Nancy. Here are the photos. Christina, Christina, why are you putting that dirty stick in your mouth? I'll be right back. Morris looked at Loud, who from shame became like a ghost from drinking it staggered. Then the captain began to look at the documents. Right. Marriage certificate. He said to himself, Becky and Loud Alex. So the children were like a bucket of cold water poured on the captain, as if in the distance. He could hear Becky scolding Loud, and the latter clumsily making excuses. And then the conversation with his Vesky on the phone from a month ago popped into his head. The puzzle came together. He realized, well, the hell with loud. Becky, yes, Morris walked over and handed her the file folder. You know, there's someone you might be interested in meeting. Who's that? The woman was surprised. And you will see, said the captain and went to the checkpoint. No sooner had he handed the phone number to the surgeon than the bell rang. C C C K P O N T, surgeon here. Yes, yes, comrade colonel. Comrade Captain, is this you? Mike, yes, and fly to me now, said Adams on the other end of the wire. Yes, Comrade Colonel. Adams looked thoughtfully out the window and smoked a cigarette. There was a knock at the door. It's open, he said. Called, Comrade Colonel called, called, said the Colonel. He went to the table and shook out the ashtray. Then he unceremoniously began gradually raising his voice. Mike, what kind of a circus with horses have you arranged here today? Eh? What are you talking about? Comrade Colonel, making an innocent look, clarified Morris. So you don't make a fool of me, Mike. Manual abuse in the relations of junior ranks is a criminal case. Adams began to point his finger threateningly at Morris. Michael turned pale, then asked. How did you find out? Mike, you've been in the army for years. In one corner. Everyone here knows everything. Daniel must have snitched. Thought Morris. You're just standing there with your mouth watering. I got a test coming up, you know. I got a test coming up, you know. And you're pulling these tricks on me. A test. If they find out about your tricks, loud the general and our whole unit. The generals will tear our whole unit apart. We'll be glad we're still lieutenants instead of privates. Comrade Colonel, let me tell you how it was. Go ahead. Just sit down, or there's no truth in your legs. Michael told the whole story with the petty officer about the shortage of machine guns, about the drunkenness in the hangar, about the complaints from Sergeant Kolosov, about the fact that women with children, about that woman with children, who showed up at the unit, turned out to be his wife. The program loud hid from her for two years, about the fiancé he had cheated and deceived all that time. The colonel, continuously smoking one after another, filling the ashtray with barrels. When, when the captain had finished, he nodded his head, sighed heavily, was silent, 
and then said, It is clear that the case is dark, but this text is loud. What to do with it? You are the captain now. You should drive him away, comrade colonel. I suspect he sold those machine guns in the first place. And this is a criminal case. The colonel stretched out. Oh, God has sent me trouble with this loud. I should deal with him. Where did the five machine guns from the unit go? I can't know, comrade colonel. But a petty officer might. Yeah. After a little thought, the colonel pressed a button on the desk. Sergeyev, I'm comrade colonel. Petty officer, I have a fly. After a while there was a knock at the door. Before that, the captain and the colonel had been waiting for him in silence. Openly said the colonel. Called comrade colonel said loudly loud stand at attention. He had already managed to sober up. His face was pale and tired. The petty officer cast an angry glance at the captain. He was staring out of the window, as if he did not notice anything. I'll tell you what you've been doing, Colonel. There have been complaints about you for a long time, and today you have arranged for me a blue light to cunning, pounding that machine guns from the part of the aunt, then bickering some woman arranges a scandals, intrigues, investigations at the checkpoint. This is a military unit here, not a brothel. But the petty officer started to justify himself. Ninok, the colonel said to me and banged his fist on the table. You'll be your wife, I finally realized, which is in my unit now. And she's making a mess of it. So, so the colonel christened the fingers of his hands. Today you write an application for transfer to another unit at your own will. And in two days, don't let your spirit be here or I'll show your mom's mom to you. That's clear. Yes, comrade colonel. Well, that's good. Okay, Morris, get out. I'm gonna talk to him about why the hell David Copperfield is in our unit. The machine guns are disappearing. What the hell kind of trick is that? Sat down fast. Morris went to the exit of the office and said honor. Let's see you tomorrow. The captain walked out, closing the door behind him, and then left the evening headquarters building. He walked slowly towards the mess hall. He wanted to get some refreshment, just in time for dinner soon. Well, that one had progressed. When Becky arrived at the military unit, at first there was a feeling that it was all some kind of a bad dream, as if the events were not happening to her and you could pinch yourself on the arm and wake up. Becky saw some fat woman who was waving her arms at the children who were running around playing soldiers, and Alex, who just looked pathetic. At that moment she realized that she was seeing him for the last time in her life. To her, he looked like a nasty grave in the forest. Loud was awkwardly waving his arms and trying to prove something to the woman. Becky approached them. Alex, what's going on here? She asked the woman in a glassy voice. Who is this woman? Nasty teased her father and then turned to Alex. You asshole. You found someone younger. While well, I was changing the kids' diapers, Oh, look at her. She looked at Becky with appraising eyes. Just like Varvara the beautiful long braid. Ugh. Woman, what do you think you're doing? Coldly, Becky replied. What do you think you're doing? How dare you take your husband away from your family? I stole your husband. Becky asked in surprise, letting out a nervous laugh and pointing her hand at herself. Tears appeared in her eyes. I think she was beginning to realize the extent of the deception. Yeah, well, you can read. Here, look, look, the woman said, holding the marriage certificate almost under her nose. Becky took the documents, her lips moving soundlessly. Becky and loud. No, it couldn't be, Becky thought, and then handed the papers back. She looked at Alex. It felt like powerful laser beams were about to shoot out of her eyes and saw him. Alex, how could you? Becky began in a trembling voice. How could I, how could I, dearie? and I'll tell you how I could. Very simple, Becky answered her. Came to our town, on a business trip at the soldier's exit button variant. Well, that's the whole story. Why don't you say something? He's walking all over the place. Hands at his sides, met me, frowned at me. I frowned at him. Doesn't it bother you that I'm almost 10 years older than you? And he women are like fine wine. It gets better and better as the years go by. Before his Anna Becky felt everything in her chest split into small pieces. Well then, Becky continued. The second time he came, 
He got me pregnant. I gave him twins. There's kids running around. Christina and Nancy were giving him an apartment. So he asked for an apartment in our town. So we started living there with the kids. He came to visit us sometimes. Becky felt as if she was falling into the working sand, and the woman went on, and then he disappeared for two years. Never heard a word from him. And I thought, God, God, it's not like the military, maybe they sent him to a hot spot. Maybe he died or something. But no, Aunt Beja is sitting here quietly, peacefully, so that she can't knit and can't stand on her feet. And his wife and children are struggling and paying rent, buying groceries, shoes and clothes for the kids. What are you looking at? You're looking at me, you miserable dog. She looked at Alex. Who's going to give the kids money? And I work from morning till night. My mom takes care of Nancy and Christina. She's old and her legs are bad. This boar is healthy, but in the woods he hid under a bush. It's not our business to give birth. Then that's the way it is with you bastard, TDC answer. My whole soul has not been spoiled by this life. For a while, all three were silent. Becky crossed her arms and looked away. The woman stared at the petty officer, and he froze like a stumbling block, lowering his eyes to the floor as if you were a guilty child. And what did he do to you, dearie? The woman turned to Becky. What about you, though? Becky waved her hand. You're as clear as the day of God. He met you? He fell in love. He forgot about his wife and children and disappeared for two years. And here he was courting you. That's how it was. No, coldly, Becky answered. Do you misunderstand? It hurts me as much as it hurts you. How am I supposed to understand? Asked Becky, starting to boil. What are you going to tell me, chicken? I need to understand. How can you not? What are you, Betty, a chicken? You got it all wrong. She teased Becky. Tell me how I'm supposed to understand, because you're so smart. You know what? Becky said calmly, barely holding back tears. Her lips were trembling. She glanced briefly at Alex and then at his wife. And I'm not going to explain anything to you. Becky exclaimed loudly. Her voice quivered. Then two rivulets of tears synchronously flowed from her eyes down her cheeks. I don't have to do this, Becky said through her sobs. You're nobody to me. And you and Alex are nothing to me now, either. I loved you, I trusted you all these years, and you. She paused a little to hold back the tsunami and the tears, then tried to say as coldly as possible, I'm going to get all my things today, I'll go home tomorrow, get a ticket for the next train. You'll never see me again. Deal with your wife. Don't come home. Otherwise, I'll call the police. Goodbye. With these words, the girl turned around and headed away from the military unit towards the bus stop. Sobs slammed into her face and tore at her chest. On the bus, the passengers looked at her sympathetically. One woman sitting next to her even patted her on the shoulder and said nothing, nothing, honey, nothing, everything will work out. You're young, you'll meet someone else. Yes, I already have, Becky thought, and remembered Michael, how she wished she could be in his arms right now. He was so safe and so good. She had even forgotten that he had accused her of lying. When she got home, Becky fell on the bed like a bobble, sobbing harshly and loudly. She didn't remember how long she roared. Her entire pillow was wet with tears. She must have sobbed so loudly that the neighbors heard. She had never been so ashamed. Becky felt small, worthless, unwanted, and deceived. For so many years he'd lied to her, hid an entire family and children from her. She had waited so long for this apartment, and he had been given it a long time ago. He gave it away so easily to some woman who got him pregnant. Yeah, a woman with kids needs an apartment more than a woman with kids. It doesn't matter that he's been with her since high school. It was starting to get dark. Becky pulled her tear-stained face away from the pillow and looked out the window. The sun was leaning toward dusk. The girl headed to the bathroom and took a hot shower. She felt better in her head and felt cleaner and clearer. She got out a white towel and washed her face with water, then put cream on her legs. We have to get train tickets and get out of here right away, she thought. There might not even be tickets anymore. The girl came out of the bathroom with a towel and wet hair. Becky resembled an ancient Greek goddess. 
who for some unknown reason suddenly found herself in this apartment. She opened her laptop and started looking at train tickets. There were two seats left on the 2114. Becky quickly paid for the ticket. So great. Now she needed to dry her hair and could pack. Suddenly the phone rang. Naturally, Becky wasn't expecting anyone. The bastard must have come in a heartbeat, Becky thought. He'll be on his knees apologizing to me again. Well, I'll give him a good one. With that thought, Becky went to the front door and coldly asked who was there. Then she looked through the peephole and aghast in the sphere of space and eyes stood Michael. He was in military uniform with a large bouquet of roses and a gift bag. Becky, it was me he said. The girl leaned sweetly with her back against the door. Her heart beat faster. A woman's pride for some reason blurted out go away. Though her heart whispered, stay with me all night. Becky, listen to me, Michael said. I was wrong. Forgive me, the colonel said. I thought you were what, what are you? Oh, why is everything so hard to say? Michael signed in. Becky looked at him through the peephole and smiled. Becky, can you hear me? Becky sighed man. I can't live normally while you're not with me. I don't sleep well. I think about you all the time. The woman's heart raced. I'm sorry I accused you, I'm sorry. There was silence for a while. Then Becky said go on. I'm here with flowers. Champagne and candy. Even a pineapple, Michael said, embarrassed. You don't mind if, in fact, I want to sit with you tonight. Let's drink champagne and talk quietly. I've missed you. You don't know how much. She felt everything inside her melt. She missed you too. For a moment, the incident with Loud really did seem like a bad dream that had happened somewhere out there a long time ago. But reality is here. And in it, there is Mike so handsome in military uniform. And with flowers, the girl was about to open the door for him but then suddenly remembered that she is still only busy on the towel. And her hair is wet, it's not good to meet him like that. He's so handsome. Becky opened the door for him with a quick whiff of the bathtub. The man saw only her pretty leg. The girl closed herself in the bathroom and shouted from their mic, come in, don't be shy. Just close the door two turns, come into the living room. I wasn't expecting you, I'm from the bathroom. I just need to dry my hair and tidy up a little. Michael walked slowly into the hallway. He found a vase, poured water and put the bouquet in. Then put the candy and put the champagne away in the refrigerator, pulled out at us. He looked kind of clumsy against the backdrop of this apartment, set down two flutes and waited for the one he'd probably been waiting for his whole life. Becky had her hair done and then ran to her room and began frantically rummaging through her closet, looking for the best lingerie. Then found a red dress that she hadn't wanted to take at all when she first went, because she thought she wouldn't need it at all. Well, she did. It's working out, Becky thought and smiled. What's life like? Sometimes an amazing thing, and sometimes looking like a madhouse sneeze. And to herself the girl. One fiancé disappeared and the second one immediately showed up. Becky looked at herself in the mirror. She was enchanted by the dress. Incredibly it suited her and brightly emphasized her beautiful forms. The girl played with her hair and said to herself goddess, and went into the room. When Michael saw her, he opened his mouth in amazement. He got up from the couch, looked at her. Becky looked at him from under her lowered eyelashes in embarrassment. How do I look? she asked. No words. You look great, Michael answered in a half whisper. But I'm glad. Flirtatiously replied Becky. She walked over to the sofa, swayed her hips and sat next to him, putting her lovely arm on the back of the sofa and put her leg over his leg. The girl looked languidly into Michael's eyes, her eyes glistened, and the captain's heart was ready to leap out of his chest. Dear captain, she said, running her finger across his chest, a drink and champagne. Of course, fussed Michael. He went to the kitchen, got a bottle. Came back into the living room with a puff of smoke and a light pop. He opened the champagne and poured it into a flute. Leaving a little foam on top, they took the glasses. And Becky asked what are we drinking to? Becky, my dear, Michael began to say. I know you don't have much time, and neither do you. But I think about you all the time. You're very beautiful, you're kind, you're understanding. And you listen to me very attentively, without interrupting. 
I've never met a woman who lets me say everything that's on my mind. It's a pleasure. But I bent my pretty head and smiled. Those words sort of flowed down my body nerves. And Michael continued. You said it was probably a one-time thing for me. Well, it wasn't. I fell in love with you the moment I saw you. I'm ready to be with you for a very long time. Maybe into my old age if you want me to. I swear to you on my honor as an officer, you're dear to me. That's all I wanted to say. Without waiting for the end of the sentence, she kissed him tenderly on the lips. Michael put his arms around her. The kiss lasted for several minutes. Then Becky stopped, looked at Michael and carried a glass to the lovely boy. What a wonderful toast. She whispered and took a sip. They sat down on the couch and began to chat. Becky and Mike laughed a lot and hugged each other. And I imagine, Michael told the colonel, I was told. But it all came together in my head. And then it turned out the couple was laughing. Turns out that one was laughing too. And I was a fool, I didn't even think to look at his personnel file. Ten years of service. So I'm like this, I get to the unit. And the sergeant from the checkpoint called me. And there stands this, said Becky, depicting without uniform contours of a woman. This creature is there looking at him, yelling something at him. Becky interrupted, because she got very funny, and she and Michael laughed. Becky continued before spilling it. Man, I cried in there. And now I'm laughing, and I can't stop. Her cheeks were flushed. Champagne hit my head. And I Polkin calls me and Mike, what are you doing? And that loud. Michael did a very funny impersonation of Adams and Becky laughed even more. It's such a madhouse. Becky said, stretching her words. I never thought life could be like this. Crying in the morning, laughing in the evening. Oh, that's it. A major thing figured out in one day. It would be nice if it was just a gradual cover-up. But like in detective stories, you see the clues, there's all sorts of suspicions. And there's no bread. In one day, it's all on a plate. What did you say about him? The machine guns are missing. Yeah, and the machine guns, and the drinking, and the wife and kids from out of town, for whom he got an apartment. It's more like a reality show, to be honest. I agree, Michael nodded. He's signing an application for a transfer to another unit, like at his own request. Adams ordered it. I don't know what they decided with the machine guns. Yeah, it's important. Becky brushed it off, taking a sip of champagne. Let him go to the woods. God, I'm so glad this is finally over. Not the way a relationship should end. Not with all the ugliness and circus. But it's over, Michael summed it up. Yes, it's over, Becky repeated. And then she said with big eyes, and new ones have begun. Shall we have a drink? Said Michael. After a while, he asked Becky, I was wondering what you thought of me. When, when I called you and told you that you cheated on me. Becky gathered her thoughts and said, at first I was very angry with you. And then I tried to forget you, but it didn't work. Then I persuaded myself that I had to build a life with Alex. It's okay that he will stop drinking and everything will change. But she said from the hobbling, I thought about you every day. I also gently said Michael, taking her hand. I really wanted you to call me constantly on the phone looking, but I wouldn't pick up the phone first, of course. I should be properly offended, but then I'd probably listen to you. And I've been meaning to call you, Michael exclaimed. Why didn't you? Becky asked jokingly, shoving him in the shoulder. I thought you wouldn't want to hear from me. And when you came here with flowers, what did you think? Victory or death? What do you mean? Well, it was simple. Either you let me in or you don't. Or you'd already gone back. I thought of all the possible scenarios. There was the scenario where you call for flowers and slap me in the face with them. Seriously. Even that happened when Becky was giggling. Even that happened. Michael repeated. The radio played nice, slow music in the background. Captain, ask your lady to dance, Becky jokingly commanded. There is comical, Michael replied. He put his arm around her waist. She put her hands on his shoulders, gazing into his eyes. They moved slowly ever so slightly swaying. Suddenly Michael asked, Becky, will you marry me? Of course, she smiled and pressed her whole body against him.